Well, welcome everyone. Um, thank you for joining the talk. Uh, this is uh, a Zephyr user story. Um, it's about my experience uh, with Zephyr in a couple of uh, the last years. And uh, yeah, shall we begin? Uh, my journey begins at Proglav uh, at the end, um, at the beginning of uh, 2015. Um, and I joined there as an um, early employee. Uh, what does Proglav do? Um, we d they develop um, uh, scanner gloves uh, for the industry. Um, so um, in the industry, for example, in manufacturing, you're scanning a lot of barcodes. Um, and for example, assembling a car, you um, scan scan parts very often and what Roglov does with the hand scanner is it saves a lot of time uh, in industry and that's what I developed um, with them. So uh, we prototyped um, a lot and um, the requirements uh, that we had were mostly um, came, came mostly from a product so it's um, sub gigahertz because in industry you cannot use um, um, 2.4 gigahertz especially Bluetooth. Um, it's a small form factor as you see because we want to fit the scanner on the back of the hand and it has to be, of course, uh, low power. And with a scanner engine that takes a lot of power, that's uh, very hard to achieve. So a lot of um, you need a big battery in there. Um, so uh, what we did in the beginning, um, of course, uh, were probably the very same mistakes that everybody does. Um, it was my first job. So um, we started off bare metal. Um, <laughs> that's that's something that uh, came out because we were prototyping uh, a lot in the beginning, uh, of course not with the same hardware uh, we later on uh, developed. So um, the product initially when we made the switch from um, prototypes to uh, the actual hardware that we were going to use, um, yeah, we just started with bare metal because we didn't know any better and we prototyped as we went. And um, yeah, requirements came in um, every so often with every new customer visit. You knew you had a new requirement, a new feature you needed to develop, and it grew very, very organically. And um, yeah, the, as, as I already mentioned, the hardware components were very heavily dictated by the product itself. I mean, it had had to have a scanner engine that needs a lot of energy um, and um, a big battery um, and a radio module because it needed to be wireless. Um, so there was actually a second device. Um, which I forgot to mention, the scanner, of course, um, sends the data to a receiver, and the receiver is connected to a, a terminal um, where the data gets funneled in either through keyboard um, input or a serial connection. Um, so yeah, uh, due to time pressure, of course, um, we made uh, the prototypes uh, later on the product, um, which led to a lot of a lot of work um, and and what we what we've built ourselves, even we even built ourselves the build system, for example, or. Uh, a serializer protocol, or um, especially the, the UX. So as I mentioned, um, every feature that a new customer requests that we just built in there because yeah, it, it just was step by step and, and there was no real, um, no real um, border where we said, okay, this is not a product. Um, and this, is, this was the prototype, this is the product, and um, we do everything new again. No, because you reuse everything you have. So, at some point, uh, when we already had a couple of devices in the field, um, we decided, okay, let's let's overhaul the hardware a little bit, um, let's overhaul the software, and uh, there we continued. Uh, or we decided to port everything to Zephyr, and uh, Zephyr, first and foremost, provided us with um, a streamlined and unified tool chain, which was a pain back then when we did everything bare metal, right? So what Zephyr had there, you just download the SDK and you're done. Um, that's um, that's it. You you have the compiler. You have the tool chain. You have everything um, that that you need to get the project running with with two downloads, the repository, and the tool chain. That's it. Um, it also it's that what what does it help you? It of course makes onboarding also easier, which um, in startups happen, happens from time to time because you don't have everyone involved in the project from the from the beginning. So um, yeah, especially documentation helps there because uh, in a startup sometimes you have don't have the time to document everything, right? So it helps to have with essential component uh, using something that's already documented. Um, of course, um, using Zephyr, it made uh, the, the hardware and, and the software, the product by itself, um, adaptable for future hardware improvements. So we tried, of course, then to have um, abstraction layers and move away from, from bare metal um, to a more scalable uh, architecture, um, if you want, want to say that. And um, of course, it, it made uh, board support uh, maintenance a lot easier because um, 
Board support um, is, is very well structured in Zephyr, and, and it's not like um, with a bare metal version, sometimes you have driver files for some arbitrary sensor lying around in a source directory, which is, um, sh should actually be buried in, in some, some layer, and you don't want to actually see that as an application developer, right? So, um, what was the timeline? Um, we shipped the first product, so the first, um, the first iteration, the bare metal version, within 12 months, um, with mostly myself, um, and I onboarded one developer in the time, uh, during the time into the product, into the development. And um, later on, uh, the, the, Zephyr, um, the Zephyr version, we, had, um, we, we made it in nine months of time. So that already accelerated, even though we onboarded uh, another two developers and two interns uh, during that time, um, where the strength, of course, was the, the heavy uh, documentation side that Zephyr had um, or, and still has um, that helps us just uh, to st tell someone, okay, look into the documentation, everything's there, this is the APIs we use, um, and you can go and uh, develop something for the application. Um, why do you actually need more developers if you uh, ship the first product within 12 months? Why do, you, why, why do you need more developers later? Well, as I said, the, the product grew organically, and of course you have devices in the field, so you need to maintain that. Um, so there's uh, bug fixing, testing, um, on-site customer visits, because uh, at the time at Proglove it was very important that uh, also engineers went to the, uh, to the customer. So um, you don't have 100% time uh, to really develop something, but there's lots of different tasks, and it's not only the features you want to develop, but uh, there's a lot around that. And um, yeah, essentially it's uh, maintaining a technical debt at some point with, uh, with a bare metal application. Um, that's why we needed more people, and of course also porting that uh, to Zephyr. Um, this took um, then overall roughly two and a half years uh, from when I joined uh, developing the, product, uh, the prototypes and the product um, up until we uh, actually CE certified uh, the second uh, product, which we then also shipped. My next uh, journey uh, was at, Pro, uh, at uh, Blick. So in um, Q4 2017, I joined Blick as a lead, now lead developer and, and team lead uh, for their hardware. And what does Blick do? Um, Blick develops a logistics tracking software. Um, so customers uh, come to us and ask us whether we can track their load carriers and, and or whether we can tell them uh, where their load uh, carriers are. <laughs> so um, for that, uh, we have a front end. Um, that uh, tells the customer where, where these um, load carriers are. So special load carriers for everyone who is not um, familiar with that is, um, so for example, in, in uh, manufacturing, car manufacturing, um, like car doors or truck axles, these are transported on special load carriers. So these are actually specific to this one part and uh, these can go in, in, in circles. So they go from the manufacturer to their customer and come back. So Every time you produce something, you need these load carriers, otherwise you cannot ship to your customer. Um, these things sometimes get lost, sometimes they pile up at uh, one of the parties. So um, yeah, that's what we're trying to solve and um, or actually uh, currently uh, already solving um, for some customers. And we need hardware for that and that's my job. So we have a, a receiver unit that's in uh, point of interest areas at the customer and a, a sensor node, sensor unit um, that's attached to the load carrier. Um, so that's what uh, that's the hardware we develop, and the Zephyr for us is running on the sensor node. So the requirements there are pretty similar to uh, what I personally experienced at uh, Proglove. Uh, so with the sensor unit, we need uh, low power uh, heavily. So these devices need to be in the field for years. Um, essentially, we want to be able to support um, the the life cycle of one load carrier, which is can be up to ten years, for example, um, and um, from a radio perspective, we are using um, 2.4 gigahertz, uh, but in uh, 802.15.4, so we don't have any um, compliance issues with uh, Bluetooth there, for example, in, in automotive industry. Um, well, it's, oh, yeah. um, so this time, um, since this was a new project, I started from scratch. Um, we decided, on, and I heavily <laughs> uh, voted for that, that we use uh, Zephyr from the beginning, um, which was um, a very good decision from my point of view now. And uh, it enabled us to uh, go from um, prototype to CE within six months. Um, to be fair, with a, with a simple application, but it uh, still shows for me that um, it, uh, very, you can go very fast from a very early prototype to actually CE compliance, which we're doing actually at the moment. Um, so lessons learned from, from my experience. Uh, 
at these companies. Um, so now, uh, within these four years, um, I was we shipped industry-grade products uh, with small teams and startups. And um, the, at, at first, at first, where, where I worked, it didn't really scale, right? So uh, bare metal doesn't scale. <laughs> You're reinventing the wheel all the time. You don't want that. Um, so just that does, just doesn't work. Um, we ported to Zephyr, so um, at the time we ported just too many um, legacy dependencies still. Like, uh, you don't want to depend on, on your old bare metal organic code. Really try to, to get rid of that and convert your customers to that because that's actually the only thing uh, that's necessary is get your customers to, um, to adapt the new product. Um, otherwise, you're going to, in development, uh, always be dependent on these old um, interfaces and libraries you developed for you internally. And um, also, we uh, actually did not upstream enough code. Like we had a lot of customizations in the kernel, which, um, from from some point of view, might make sense because you want to build a custom project. Uh, some things might not fit your device, um, but it's it's very important to just to just upstream that because uh, sooner or later you want to upgrade the kernel, and uh, you just have to rebase that always. Uh, and and that Zephyr changes, of course, but it has a very very good abstraction layer which uh, prevents you from um, rewriting the application every time you change a sock or change, the ha change some hardware component, right? And bare metal, that's just um, always the case. And uh, yeah, that generally makes, you, uh, makes, made, makes me very sad uh, because that's usually not fun maintaining like these, all these legacy components. Um, so later, um, I decided, okay, let's do this uh, with Zephyr. Um, and we are still not upstreaming enough uh, in, in Blick, of, although we do. So uh, I can't, I can't uh, stress this enough. Like, by upstreaming, you get so much exposure to freelancers, which can help you in development. Like We had a couple of freelancers engaged in our, in our um, projects. Um, that, that just helps you get the, get the project going, because in startups, you're generally resource-constrained, right? You want to have someone helping you with this, and upstreaming is, is just the way to go, at least from, from my opinion now. Um, for example, um, we, we have some, some flash drivers um, that uh, we currently still maintain ourselves internally, and um, which is at the moment actually the, 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 biggest, the biggest pool of conflict uh, if you want to upgrade uh, to a new kernel. Um, on the other hand, uh, we made some changes to network to the network stack because it, um, currently we're not really able to use uh, the Zephyr network stack due to some constraints, and um, that is also not yet upstream. I'm 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 in pro in the progress of um, um, engaging discussions there, um, but. What Zephyr then actually enables us to do very fast is actually adapt the network stack very easily. So um, we just introduced our own radio API and we were able to use that in the application. Um, that was very fast. It took me like one or two weeks um, and then we were ready to go and it, without any hassle and some sort of conformity in the project that, um, that that's not very, um, yeah, that, that's not a heavy technical debt. Um, of course, uh, using off-the-shelf components uh, where possible, for example, like the uh, a serializer, for example, that we wrote ourselves, uh, we don't do that anymore, just use an off-the-shelf serializer, and it's very easy with Zephyr to integrate these external libraries into the build system, um, like for example, uh, protobuf, if you want to use that, it's very easy. Uh, Zephyr uses CMake, and if you find a library that also is uh, built already uh, with CMake, it's very easy to get these uh, integrated as a submodule sub in your project and just integrate it in your build system and you're done. Um, also shell access, for example, for testing and debugging. Um, if, if you know, like you don't just build the features, but also testing components. Um, for example, end of line testing or um, compliance testing for CE, for example, um, requires you to test certain functionality on the device and just to get some IO on a serial port, for example, for the device, just use the shell um, of Zephyr. It helps you, you can, um, hook your own functions in there and, and implement the testing and um, the interface is already there. Just use that. Um, so yeah, sticking together uh, components with Zephyr is really simple due to its uh, very coherent build system, in my opinion. Um, and of course, the build, pr uh, the build process, um, if you're talking about CI and embedded, um, there's actually not, not too many uh, options uh, that are very out of the box. For example, testing without actually mocking uh, a sensor or an interface, for example. 
uh, but at least the build process is very easy to implement in a CI and you at least want to have that for before you merge something from a merge request. Yep, makes me happy. Uh, so uh, generally using Zephyr for these types of projects, especially in, in fast paced environments, um, yeah, makes me smile. So uh, yeah, as you saw, most of my experience uh, came from startups and um, as I also already mentioned, um, startups care about features. Like, it's about sales, like you have these big goals, um, everything that's, that's touchy and shiny, you can sell, right? So actually everything that you can tell to a business guy, okay, we're, I'm working on that and that and that, and he can actually try it out. Um, that's very, very nice. And everyone sees, oh yeah, you're working on stuff. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's not always the case, right? So. Um, um, what you do is you work in a very fast uh, environment, so prototypes, iterations, and fast to market. Uh, but you have to, as I mentioned, uh, implement the build system, the board support, uh, uh, tests for production environment, um, and that's not very flashy. You cannot show that to a sales guy um, and tell them, hey, tell that to the customer. We can do that. Like, no one cares. Um, um, yeah, and that's, this makes progress feel very slow uh, for these people and it makes it very hard for you to justify uh, the, the resources you need for development. And um, this is why you actually want to have something to work with um, that takes off a lot of work from, from your development process, um, especially in uh, low resource uh, environments. So um, since your backlog is always growing and um, you want to implement features um, and your resource constraints, you want something that takes off uh, this, this general load uh, around it, and you can actually, at least to some bigger degree as usual, focus on these features. And uh, yeah, for that, uh, what you want is a solid build system. Um, you want to have a solid architecture, that, or at least something that gives you already the, uh, the framework of a solid architecture, so you can orient yourselves along that. Um, these, like interfaces, serial interfaces, radio interfaces, networking, anything you can think of. Um, and the ecosystem, of course, because you want to have people to talk to if you have problems, right? So if you use some, um, some, if, if you build your own bare metal application, you can't ask anyone, right? You're probably, even worse, you're dependent on this one developer that, that developed the kernel, but he left last week. Um, that sucks. Um, uh, yeah, so community is very important, uh, and standards are very important. Like, um, most likely, for example, in the case of Zephyr, there's already um, libraries supported, like MQTT, Co-op, if you want to use that. You don't have to worry about implementing that in your build system or uh, general development. You can just tell an intern, hey, prototype that for me, and um, he, he will be able to do that because the documentation is actually very good, and there's a lot of samples already, or Bluetooth. Like, you won't have any problems getting a Bluetooth application running with a, with a dev board that's already supported. Um, so um, this brings us generally to the to the Artos choice. Um, so um, it influences actually your roadmap um, because you have to think about all these things th that you want to develop, set up, um, and maintain around your project. Um, and um, yeah, you want to use something that gives you uh, all the components that you actually want to use in that regard. And there's a couple of um, artists, of course. Um, we, we, of course, looked into them, like um, Embed OS, Contiki, Free Artos, Riot, maybe, if you're, if you're, um, if you're okay with the license, uh, especially. Um, yeah, and in our case, we, we decided for Zephyr because uh, it actually applied uh, very well to all these requirements, in my opinion, uh, for where you have to work on hardware support, the tool chain, uh, all the testing that you want to do. Um, these APIs and interfaces that you, that you actually need for, for any IoT application uh, in, in that regard. Uh, drivers you need for your sensors or radios, uh, application libraries like I mentioned, MQTT and so on. Uh, and especially the license because you want to be able to make modifications to the kernel and actually maybe uh, don't want to wanna publish them even though I think upstreaming is the better option. But sometimes you don't always want to, want to publish them because you want to prototype first and, and ship a prototype to a customer. Um, and you want to be compliant with the license, right? And um, with Zephyr, it's really easy. Um, so yeah, uh, in my opinion, um, Zephyr falls very well uh, in all these requirements. So uh, it's, a, it's a very nice code style. Uh, so it's very easy to actually read a driver or read, um, read implement anything that's implemented in Zephyr and um, look around and find your way around the code. It's very easy to get used to that and very easy to, um, uh, to adapt it. Um, and the documentation is very nice uh, because 
as far as I work with Zephyr, there's really nothing that's not really documented. So you find something for everything. And generally, the API documentation is very well, because if I'm not mistaken, it's uh, exported from, from the docs in comments. And um, yep. On the other hand, it, it helped me ship products fast, right? So six months uh, from, from prototype to C, uh, when I see that somewhere else, um, if you have a pile of requirements and want to build something from scratch, uh, yeah, not easy. Especially, uh, don't f people forget about prototyping, uh, production, and, and testing, right? So it's not just about these, this, yeah. How difficult can it be to send a packet to, an, to, to, to a, another device, a second device, just a receiver? I just want to do that. Yeah, but <laughs> eventually, if you, especially if you work in industry, you want to be able to certify that product, and you need to go through testing and, and end of line testing and, and, and certification. And um, yeah, features is not everything you're going to be working on. Um, I was able to maintain all these projects with relatively few people. Um, so onboarding always was very fast, um, even though it was painful, of course, if you're in a release window. Um, onboarding someone is not really fun. Um, but it's, it was easy because you could just pinpoint them to the documentation. Um, and also with freelancers. Um, in the beginning, like when I, when I worked at Proglove, it was Zephyr 1.6, I think, um, when we started working with Zephyr. It was not easy to find freelancers, um, but uh, anyway, these, the freelancers we found were very easily able to, uh, to work their way uh, through it and, and then actually contribute something we could really use in the product. Um, and Zephyr's community is, is very welcoming. Like from my point of view, if you're chatting in a, an IRC, just asking a question, there will be definitely someone who, who answers your question, which is necessary because you don't want to be roadblocked by something like that. Um, and upstreaming is also very direct. Like we upstreamed a real-time clock driver um, for one of our socks, and um, it was very easy. We found a freelancer for, who was already involved in Zephyr, so it was even better. And um, yeah, usually people are, are there for, even from from the chip vendors like NXP or Nordic, where the the, the board board support, for example, is already very good. So if you want to prototype something. Um, just use use these these boards, and they work out of the box. Uh, usually, for for most of the common um, applications like Bluetooth or 15.4. And um, if you have questions about that, you're very easily able to contact these persons because they're generally maintainers of an open source project. Yeah. So, um, in my opinion and my experience, what I what I had right now have right now even even today, is um, that they're very forthcoming and 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 friendly towards you if you just ask them, hey. Why does this driver work? How does this work? Is there? Do you know someone who can help me with that? So, um, yeah, very nice. And um, of course, also something that comes with upstreaming is um, it gives you um, it gives you more reviews, right? So during our upstreaming from the real-time clock driver, for example, uh, we had more eyes than just our own to to review that. And what what. But that uh, what we benefited from that is actually um, okay. Our driver was better afterwards, and it integrated better with Zephyr, um, right? So, and this gives us uh, more experience with working with Zephyr, and later on being able to better upstream, and in general raising the quality of uh, of the real-time operating system, and eventually your own product, right? And your own flexibility in upgrading later or changing something. And uh, yeah, at last, uh, I wanna. Thank everyone uh, who worked uh, with me up until now and today, and um, everyone who gave feedback to the talk. And um, I think it's uh, time for questions. Yes. Yes. So I think this heavily depends on your. Uh, so I, uh, maybe I repeat the question. So what was most painful with Zephyr? Um, because I. Um, Mention a lot of advantages. So one disadvantage, for example, is the network stack. Um, so currently, um, it supports IP. And with IP, you can I think you can do a lot of things. But if you, for example, in our case, want to interface directly with the radio or directly with layer 2, that's not possible. Um, you, it's, it's, uh, so there, um, and then on the other hand, it was very easy to, to throw in our own interface, right? So. If you're going to work with, um, with the net stack, that's um, probably depending on what you really want to do with, um, with it, with your product. Um, on the other hand, uh, for example, regarding low power management, um, low power management is something that's very use case specific. Um, I talked to um, one or two developers uh, some time ago, uh, earlier this year, 
and uh, there's no not really low power management implemented. Uh, you have uh, the hooks for it, so if you use um, the kernel, um, the kernel goes to low power if it um, enters the idle thread. Um, and um, still, you need to take care of yourself uh, to actually shut down all the devices and all the sensors. And um, then again, there's there's tools for that uh, that make it makes it very easy. Uh, for example, the uh, drivers generally support a low power hook that you can can also call um, in the in the Sysox suspend call. Um, and I think in 1.13 there is now actually a a, a template implementation of, of, of parts of that. If, I, if I'm not correct, if I'm correct. And um, that that takes uh, that takes work. And then, of course, depending on what type of low power management you actually need for your applications, and for example, in our case, the devices need to be essentially in low power all the time. Um, so then, there's the question: How do you use uh, Zephyr at all? Um, I mean, do you need threading? Um, and how do you make sure the radio wakes up in a correct state and things like that? So you have to look into these things that then um, probably need some adaptions in the drivers, and then it also makes sense to, to upstream that in some cases. Yeah. Um, other than that, um, I think uh, a lot of things have improved, really. So back in 1.6, I think that was around the time when Zephyr actually got uh, went public um, two years ago. Mm. There were a lot of things that, that um, were, fr from a driver's point of view, um, not really implemented to 100%. Um, still, I think the, the peripheral support is very good, but sometimes you just need to implement, implement another port or something like that. At, at the moment, I think the, the support for that is really good. Uh, like in our case, we didn't really need to implement anything else um, um, in that regard. But back then, and especially if you use um, some SOC that's not yet supported or fully supported, then um, the advantage in, the, in that case would be you need to implement it. Yeah. Yes, very easy. Um, there was um, a time, so so two years ago, um, it was still all kconfig. Um, they moved to DTS now, device tree, um, which needs some getting getting used to but if you're used to DTS it's very easy and there's there, there's there might be some some things you need to port to DTS yourself for your board um, but in general there's like a lot of support from the community if you have questions about that that's really straightforward like adding a custom board for example if you use a sock that's already supported in a um, dev board for example you just copy that dev board and make your adaptions it's very easy any more questions Yes, please. Uh, so you said you started on Zephyr 1.6, so it's uh, the very, very beginning of, uh, of Zephyr. Um, what, uh, weren't you afraid of seeing uh, just so many changes happening at the same time that you were developing your product? And wouldn't that, uh, didn't that scare you? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So uh, maybe to elaborate a bit on that, because yeah, and just no is, is, is funny, but uh, the, the thing is if you don't plan to upgrade, then yeah, uh, because if, if you start developing the product based on a kernel like we do right now, uh, it's a question of um, are you happy with the uh, stability of the system? If yes, there's at first no need to upgrade, um, and later on actually upgrading. So for, uh, at the time when I, uh, at Proglove, we updated from 1.6 to 1.9. That was actually very easy. Uh, the only thing we had to ad adapt was, I think, the uh, SPY API that uh, was um, that was rewritten. Um, but other than that, um, I, it, and it was also a new a new product cycle. So we had the time. I mean, w w what means afraid? Maybe you can can specify a little bit what what do you mean by afraid. At the time, I'm not sure if if the microkernel uh, nanokernel transition had already taken place, the kconfig had oh, yeah. already taken place, and and so many things you're doing your development, yeah. and you're going through a, through that heavy amount of modifications. Yes. It's is is that going to be a problem for your for your application or not? Yeah. Uh, whereas uh, it's interesting to see that you still decided to go with that, even at that early stage of the project. I understand. Yeah. Um, so generally, we always use the stable versions. Um, like the versions get get tagged, and uh, because because Zephyr is developed in a way that you have, uh, I think there's three release candidates uh, always, and they get also patched um, during that time. And if that's tagged, 
that's more or less stable um, because there's also a, a stabilization phase for the release candidate uh, before they uh, finish the release. Um, so in general, I would say um, I, I, I personally wouldn't be afraid of using a stable version. If you use a version that's just master, um, I, yeah, I wouldn't be so sure about that. Then I, then I would be afraid because um, there might be some components that still depend on, on a different API and something like that. So, so these might break things later on in your application or your own kernel adaptions. But uh, generally, um, going with a stable version, I wouldn't be, wouldn't be too afraid. Any more questions? Very well then, thank you so much.